You've all heard the term self-preservation. Right? You've always, I'm sure, understood. You have clarity on what that means, right? <laughs> Most of us do. Self-importance. That's like when people think they're really important when they're really not. <laughs> and they have to tell you how important they are and stress how important they are all the time. And self-surrender. These are kind of an order and a pattern. And I knew the subject that I wanted to talk about today, but I had to find the right place in the Bible. The Bible is, you can find anything you want to teach and to illustrate and to glean. So I wanted to find something that captured that, but at the same time, um, I chose a chapter out of the Old Testament that actually brings four different reactions from four different personages all packed into one chapter. Um, the main focus, I will stress, but there are some minor players that have either self-preservation, self-importance, or self-surrender at their core. So I'm going to take you today to 2 Kings, and which comes after 1 Kings. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the fifth chapter. And it's a, probably a familiar one for those who have read this. I can ask you, how is the temperature in here? Is it hot? A little stuffy? I'm thinking, I'm standing up here, and I'm thinking, am I just hot, or is it hot? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't take that that way. That would be self-importance. <laughs> Somebody please put the air conditioner on just a little bit more. As I am, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm in a pool of sweat. And I cannot stand here another minute. It's like the demons of the old days have surfaced. <laughs> Except we don't have to deal with the loud blower anymore. All right, keep your mind on the Lord, folks. So at 2 Kings, 5th chapter, and begins with now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So six things we are told about this man captain of the host of the king of Syria, great man with his master, honorable. His military successes are credited to the Lord and that he's a leper. This is a very strange, you know, you can read some of these things and you can read right by them. This is a very strange um, description. Six things about this man. It's interesting that six is the number of a man, but six things are said about this individual. And I could take the time to, to elaborate, but I think they kind of are self-evident. The last one is the most peculiar one, because within reason, now I'm going to use the word Gentile. He's, this is not a man considered a man worshiping the God of Israel, so I'm going to refer to him as a Gentile. So different than those who would be familiar with the Mosaic Law and the prescriptions of the Mosaic Law for leprosy and for lepers, there is no prescription here for the Gentile. It just is. It's a condition. Um, if I were to take the time, if I were to take the time, but I've kind of written a synopsis in front of me of the 14th chapter of Leviticus, which describes in great detail how the leper presented himself not to a doctor but to the priest. Three lepers were cleansed in the Old Testament, and it's interesting, Naaman is one of them, um, but the one that you probably comes to your mind instantaneously is Miriam, but the one not so evident is Moses. He was actually he had leprosy for a short time when God was just about to send him to Pharaoh. Put your hand inside, take it out, see how white it is, put it back in. For a time, even Moses was smitten with leprosy. So it's kind of interesting, the three that were healed. Um, what is interesting in the law? 
You know, most people tend to read over those chapters in Leviticus because they have so much detail in them and they kind of at times can appear a little tedious and laborious to read. Um, but there are some interesting things if you take the time in your own time to read that 14th and part of the 15th chapter, I believe, of Leviticus. The actual cleansing of a leper in the law took place over eight days. And it's interesting because really the eight is the number of new beginnings. And really what happened on the seventh day was a repeat of the first day in preparation for the eighth day, if that makes any sense. But all of these represent stages. If we were to take types and look at the types of Christ, we could also see here are types unfolded as well. Um, the priest would take a small bird and kill it over an earthen vessel and then also kill it under running water. And I don't think there's an error there. The earthen vessel is typified. We could call it the, the earthly or earthen body of Christ. The water, we could talk about it as the Holy Spirit or the Word of God. But these things all somehow merge together. The hyssop, the, the blood, the scarlet, um, what is attached when they took the cedar stick and attached the hyssop for the priest to seven times um, sprinkle the leper. So all of these things are interesting, and they, they actually play into a prescription that will be given to name in a very weird way, actually, because the law is not being followed here. There's a different prescription for this man's leprosy, but you've got to always go back and see how God dealt with it in its clearest way. In fact, in its clearest way, if you go back and read the chapters in Leviticus, you find out that although the priest went through the rituals that were prescribed, there was no guarantee that a leper would actually be healed and or they could be cleansed, but not guaranteed to be healed. That's a very interesting thing. In other words, in that culture and in that time, it was a walking death sentence. Unless God did the act, not, we're not talking about the cleansing portion, which the priest would take one through, but unless God did the actual act of healing, that was your fate. You were essentially a walking dead person. The leper was to wash his clothes, shave his hair, wash his body. And these are all little tidbits that you think, well, why these details? And all of these represent, if you think about it, you could take all the things that this individual is told to do and look at a New Testament perspective to see, first of all, thank God we don't have to uh, do, go through the acts of shaving our hair, because they shaved everything off, eyebrows, any type of hair, everywhere. All of it, all right? <laughs> uh, and some of the people in here went, phew, we love our Lord. Uh, but the details are extremely important because as you go into the New Testament, you see that those details are actually kind of in broader sense uh, embodied by Christ himself. There are many contradictions in this passage. I'll give you the first one as I go back to read. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So I want you to just kind of juxtapose one thing. We have this great man who is the leper and this little woman who is an Israelite and she is essentially the servant of Naaman's wife. Just hold that thought for a minute, because there's, there's two, here are, I've introduced two personages in here, and something interesting that happens. She said unto her mistress, and this is the shame of the King James, would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Um, I, I wish that I could just say it just like this. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. It should just read like that. Would God, my Lord, just kind of, I don't know what that means. But essentially that, if he would just only see, if my master would only see, now see, this is what's interesting. This is the woman who has been taken captive. We don't even, we don't even know this woman. We don't know her name, just a little, she's referred to as a little maid, a little woman who is serving Naaman's wife. And she says, if only my master, this is interesting that she's referring to Naaman as master, uh, would see this prophet 
in Israel, or he could be, who is in Samaria, he, he, could, be, he could heal him of his, of his leprosy. Now, why is this such a big deal? Um, because, first of all, she's a servant, so I guess my, my mind goes to the first thing is, this woman is much like an Esther personality taking a risk of opening her mouth, number one. Number two, she doesn't say maybe he could be healed. With great faith, this is, it's just, it's just there. You could almost read by it and miss the fact that she says if he'd only go, he'd be healed. And that's quite staggering. So an unknown little woman, sorry, this rubs people the wrong way, but she is a messenger of the Old Testament good news. There's no fanfare here. She just says if only he would go, he'd be healed. There's this great faith coming out of this little woman. So this great man who's a leper and this little woman who's a servant. And out of her mouth comes these words. Now, that should be just as a little footnote here that um, you know how in the New Testament, how it describes, Paul says, God uses the smaller, the base things. Here's this little woman opening her mouth and saying a thing. And of course, what's interesting is the reaction of the wife because it says, and one went in, obviously the wife went in and told his Lord, the King James is kind of a mess here, saying, thus and thus, thus, and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Now, this is kind of where things go interesting. The words came from that little maid, the words of good news, go and be healed, essentially, if he'd only go. The news is carried, and it seems like, you know, we, we can just read right by this, but this is how even the good news today is is spread. And I hate to tell you, but you know, you can find a lot of examples, not just of women, but of people in general who have this great faith and they make a bold declaration. And it's all designed for those of us who can understand those who God gives the capacity to hear and to see versus those that don't. It could have been that the wife could have said, oh, this is nonsense. My husband bows down at the shrine of Rimon or whoever, whatever, whatever God exists, and he's the only God. But yet, her words were listened to. And that's why I tell you, never discount the messenger, but more importantly, listen to the message. Because it's the greatest error, I'm telling you now, with all of these years behind me, including looking at the years of Dr. Scott's ministry, where people focused on the wrong thing. I preached a message on this once. If you keep looking at the messenger, you will never hear the message. So that's a small little detail, but quite important. The king of Syria said, go, go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have wherewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. It came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send to me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and I see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Now, just stop for a second and follow the line of thinking. There's so many things going on here. Some people hear, and their device is obviously not tuned in to the right frequency. What did she say? Oh, that my master would go and see the prophet. Isn't that what she said? Yeah. He will be healed. She never said, write a letter. She never said, go write a letter to the king. See, this is what bothers me about the way even we read this book at times. It's how we, our interpretation of what we're reading. And the best thing about this is we'll always say, well, I thought. Well, I mean, somebody else will say that too in here. I thought. That's the problem. I mean, we want people, I want people to be thinking people when they come in the door, but sometimes the I thoughts are not good news. Because a lot of those thoughts are based on poor listening, some strange mechanism that changes what has been said to what you'd like it to say, or how you thought, well, I know that she said that. Uh, no, I didn't. And neither did she. 
So I want you to take notice of this. He heard, and to some degree, there is definitely on the part of Naaman the desire. Obviously, he wants to be healed, but there's self-preservation at the get-go, self-interest, self-importance of um, how, obviously, he goes straight to the king, not listening to the instructions. And the instructions were, go. I wish my master would go and see. And I believe that there would have been no requirement for any letter at all. And look what happens. The reaction of the king. This is what I love about this book. The reaction of the king of Israel, because he's so corrupt, is to essentially say, am I God? He's corrupt, by the way, and obviously he doesn't believe in the prophet that lives in his own backyard. Think about this. Because if, if he did, he would have said, I can't, but I know a man who can't. You know, this is the stuff that... You know, you, you kind of read this and you, you discover that there are personages in here that fit really all the types that you'll encounter in the church. Um, so it's remarkable. The, the reaction of the king, am I God to kill, to make alive this man, thus send me to recover a man of his leprosy? And he says, he thinks this is war, this is a trick and it's a plot to make war with him. Now, there is self-importance if I've ever seen it. You know, he, he's so worried about himself and he can't really see that whatever, the, whatever was contained in the letter obviously didn't really matter to him, the fact that this man thinks that he's going to come to him with his condition. No sympathy, obviously. Um, you know, the king kind of reminds me a little bit of those people that say, you're gonna, you've heard me say this for weeks now, they say they're Christians, but they don't know the Bible. They say, oh, I'm a Christian. Ask them one question about the Bible, and they cannot answer it. Or they can tell you, they can lecture you about the, the, the um, quick quips over the years that they have morphed into what they thought it says. Um, they've heard people say things. You know, I have these discussions all the time with people, and it really it, it, it's bog it might boggles my mind that here's a man who, would, who should know who's in his kingdom. He should know who... Of course, he does indeed know and would know the prophet Elisha. And let me back up for a minute, because there's something else here that's equally important. Is when Naaman is leaving, it says he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. So he was ready to pay generously <laughs> for his healing. This is the other thing. Too many people have a skewed idea of what exactly it means to hear the message of grace. Now, I'm one that will tell you, you give when you're taught, that's the response that should happen inside you. But if you think that you can buy your way in or work your way in, you're sorely mistaken. So it's kind of interesting. He even has a skewed idea of how to approach this subject by bringing all of this good stuff with him. Now, don't think that Elisha, who will, he's going to encounter him in a minute, don't think that he has never accepted anything from anybody, because if you read his story and his miracles, there are plenty of times when he is receiving and accepting things. In this case, there was a specific reason as to why th these gifts would not be taken. Let's keep reading now. So. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, and that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, don't you think that's tragic, that the prophet has to remind the king and not the other way around? The king should have said, I know, as I said, I know a man who can, right? Instead, Elisha gets wind, and he says, Send him to me. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Now, I want you to catch all this. It's important details. Elisha didn't go out and speak to him. It says he sent a messenger unto him. A great man, man of valor, man of importance, should have had the red carpet rolled out in front of Elisha's house and there should have been people standing and waiting at attention to salute this great man of importance. But instead he sends his messenger out there. 
That's kind of, that's kind of a downer, right? <laughs> okay, now I think it's getting too cold in here, by the way. My fingers are getting cold. I might have to go put on some gloves. <laughs> no, just have one of my hats underneath here and just put on a hat and gloves. And <laughs> I'll be sitting there going, oh, is it over yet? Mm. Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, slowly, let's go through this again. I want you to know that Elisha did not go out and meet this important man. A messenger sent by Elisha did. And that's, that's important. That means that in God's program, God knows the who's who will say in the realm of the world, but he also can figure out this is the even playing field here because he sees everything the same way. Sin is sin. But Naaman was wroth and went away. And here it comes. And said, Behold, I thought. See, I told you there was an I thought coming up. <laughs> Behold, I thought. He will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Right? That's what, that's what Naaman was expecting. It's, it's cold now. Sorry. That's what Naaman was expecting. He was expecting some ceremony to happen. Some, oh, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? Yeah. I thought. I thought he will surely come out to me. I'm so important come out to me. He sent his messenger instead. Come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord as God. Strike his hand over the place. I was expecting ceremony, ritual. I was expecting something great to happen here. This is it. You send your messenger outside and say, go and wash seven times. This is, this is why I told you this if I could take this message and make everybody hear it out there in La La Land, <laughs> because that's the problem. People come into the church and they, expect, they are like Naaman. They are expecting that there should be some great fanfare and there should be some great, that's it. She, she came out here, they did music. She came out here, she spoke for an hour and they sung again and she left, that's it. Now listen, I'm, I'm not Elisha, but that's the mindset of people. That's it. The instructions are too simple. Go wash seven times. I was thinking he was going to tell me, now I've got to lay down. <sighs> then I've got to make snow angels. <laughs> then I have to bow a couple of times. And I'll cross myself a little bit for good measure. And then, <laughs> hallelujah, I can feel it already, right? <laughs> Hair's good? Good. There's way too many Naamans around here. You know what I'm saying? I thought. If there's anything you want to circle in your Bible right now, it's the I thought part. Because that's what's wrong with most, most people. I, I'm telling you, I don't, want, I don't want this to be a message where people say, well, pastor doesn't want us to think. I want you to be thinking people, but the problem is don't think of approaching God's way and God's word and God's person your way and saying, well, I thought this is... Now listen to what's being said here. Are not Abana and Parfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Hey, listen, if you know the geography, those beautiful streams of Lebanon are crystal clear. And if you've ever seen the Jordan, Eve. <laughs> like, you know, the people say, oh, we're going on a tour. We're going to go get baptized in the Jordan. Knock yourself out, friends, and bring the bleach cloths 
because after you go in the Jordan, you are going to want to disinfect yourself. It's just disgusting. And what I'm telling you, I mean, some people may say, well, that's, that's very wrong, but that means you haven't seen it because it's just murky and gross, and it's gotten more disgusting over the years with all the tourists that go and whatever they do in the Jordan. <laughs> Take me to the water. <laughs> I guarantee you, you get a talkative tour guide, and I've seen those people, and you know, everybody's, they're, they're going to be baptized, and they want to start pontificating about what happened here, and they're there for an hour in the water. What do you think is happening in that water? <laughs> You'd be better off being baptized in the kiddie pool, all right? <laughs> Just saying. So he says, are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? So the problem is that he thought it would be better to be, if I had to go and wash and dip and cleanse myself seven times in clean water than this dirty water. It was even dirty back then, by the way. So he turned and he went away in a rage, not willing to listen to the instructions. Now you can, you can go to the New Testament, and this is on a similar note, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do? and I've done all these things from my youth. And Jesus said to him specifically, this is not a general order to all the people, but to that one man who was rich, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then follow me. And he went away very sorrowful because he had many, much possessions and he wasn't willing to do what the Lord had bade him to do. Here, we have clear instructions from the prophet. The messenger tells him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Just too easy. There has to be something more. I gotta go, I gotta go in the waters of my choice. I gotta do it the way I think it ought to be done. Not my will, Lord, but thine. But just let me put a halo on what I want to do under the guise that it's all for you. That's the other part of Christianity that really works well, if you've noticed. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not then have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Smart servants right there. You know, if, if the prophet said, You've got to go and skydive and, well, I don't know about skydiving. Let's pick something that's realistic for that day and age. You've got to go and do hand-to-hand -hand combat with the fiercest, meanest lion and live. <laughs> and then after that, you got to maybe give maybe the challenge like they gave to David. You know, so many Philistine uh, circumcisions, all right? So many things that had to be obtained. You know, give me some impossible thing that I have to do. Give me some, that's it? Go and dip seven times, that's all? Yep. So smart servants. I like this. Servants come and they say, you know, if they ask you to do some big, great big thing, would you not do it? So how much rather than just to wash and be clean? Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. Now, I can just see this man going down once and coming up. And let me backtrack for a second, because to, in order to go and dip in that water, he had to strip himself of all of his, his military men, of all of his, all the trappings that marked him as an important person. Now, you can kind of fail to understand that in the bigger scheme of things, that God sees everything the same way. Once you strip away all the garbage and all the claptrap we like to put on ourselves, strip down to, if he was wearing his little skeevies or whatever he was wearing, maybe he was wearing nothing, doesn't matter. Now he's dunking himself and probably the first time down, probably coming up and he was probably gritting his teeth saying, this is dumb, I'm just dirty. Second time going down, coming up, up, oh, nothing's changed. Third time, fourth time, fifth time, Sixth time, wouldn't have been something on the sixth time. He said, I'm out of here. This is stupid. <laughs> it was just one dip away. <laughs> but it says he dipped himself 
seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And that's the miracle of this passage. Here's a man who was very important, important in his own mind, in preserving his own way. There was something wrong, by the way, in all of this, which you can sift down to pride, that this was just too easy. You know, people will come into the church and they will, they will ask the same question over and over again. For this ministry, the question is always, well, why doesn't she do an altar call? Because there has to be some action. There has to be a call to action. There has to be something that I should do. I've told you the story when I came into the church, and I hadn't been in the church in a long, long time. And I thought, well, surely there's something that I'm supposed to do. I, just like Naaman, there's something that, this is too easy. I just sit here and I listen and I, I study and I read and that's just too, there must be something missing. And then you realize after a while that the thing that Christ said, well, this, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? He didn't say, will he find good workers or good works? Or He said faith. And the only way faith comes is by hearing the word of God. And faith is increased as you seize opportunities that may seem dumb at face value to go dip in dirty water seven times. But if the man of God said, this is the way you're going to be clean, then me thinks that if that's what it says, then go and do what it says. And he says he was clean. And he returned to the man of God he and all of his company and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I shall receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And the reason is very simple. In this particular instance, Elisha knew that there was no way if he took the money, if he took the goods, it would be that Naaman could go away and say he had procured it in, in, in a way. No, this was all done of God. And this is the same way we describe salvation. It's all of God, not of works, but by faith. And we're saved by faith. And faith alone takes you in and takes you all the way home. So we, we've not covered all the people, though we're close to getting all the people here. He urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules, burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto, unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when thy master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and leaneth upon my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. And he departed him a little way. Not done here, because we've at least seen some part of the reaction. And, but there is something I want to talk about, because it's delightful to know that when God says something, you want to pay attention. And in this case, like I said, from the beginning, we've got the word of this prisoner, servant, little woman, little maid, whose words, whose declaration of this good news and ob obviously acted on and followed through was true to the ones who went in to, to Naaman, who quite, you know, he heard, but he quite couldn't wrap his mind around the thing. So, of course, it's this misdirected, well, I must, I must go over here instead of going directly to the source, as the woman said. And then his... You know, his protest, there has to be something more. There's got to be something bigger here than just this act of dipping. Made clean, he can't buy the profit. He cannot buy what happened. No amount of money can buy it. And last but not least is what happens to the close of the chapter, which I think is a delicious inclusion here. But Gehazi, I could, I could just do a message on those two words, but Gehazi. <laughs> the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, 
I will run after him and I will take somewhat of him. I am on a mission from God. I got to go take that stuff that, was, that should have been taken. Elisha's stupid. He doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going to go and get it. Now, this is a note to the few critics out there who are always busy nitpicking. You know, well, if I was her, I would, I'd never send people's money back if they have an issue with the ministry or with her. No, that's called character before God. That's called doing, doing it God's way because that's what the people in this book would have done. Same principle. But there'll always be a Gehazi that's in, in the, a Gehazi in the midst that wants to say, well, you know, you shouldn't let that go to waste right there. So if you don't take it, I will. There's a sucker born every minute, right? So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well, but of course everything's good. My master hath sent me, this lying, conniving guy, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garment. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver and two bags and two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand, bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. So lying, conniving, greedy. And this is, by the way, this is someone who's, uh, we'll call him Elisha's servant, his right-hand man. So there's another lesson here that uh, Assyrian... Gentile can be a better convert than the one right next to the preacher. That'll hit some of you soon. Uh-oh. Why'd you have to go ruin the message with that? But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went, went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maidservants? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and to thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Now, here's what's interesting. What a, what a bad way to end a chapter. You know, you want... So we want this to be like a reality show where everything ends well in 30 minutes and everybody's happy. But the fact of the matter is, there's, there are, as I said, there are several people in here, several personages that take a lesson of self-importance. Not just this Gentile uh, mighty man, but this servant of Elisha's who thought he was important. In his mind, he was, this is greed at work but it's self-importance. Well, if you're not going to do this thing, I'm, I'm going to look out for me. This is my deal. I'm going to go get that stuff. And what's so charming about this is, again, you can take a page out of this and put this in the New Testament because this is exactly what happened with the Spirit of God revealing the acts of Ananias and Sapphira. Like, you really think you're going to fool God? Which is why I said from the get-go, and I've been saying this for many weeks now, you know, I think... The statement that's been said here for so many times, if you're going to be a Christian, be one, should be understood in this way. That if the Spirit of Christ is with an individual, the Spirit of God is with an individual, it means at all times, it means for the, the, the heathen uh, mighty man, just as much as the maiden who's in prison, obviously in, in servitude for a purpose, as part of we'll call it the cog and the salvation of this man and his cleansing, but equally so to show you that there can be people right beside the prophet, the man or the woman of God, who are just dirty rats looking out for themselves. Buyer beware. That's all I got to say to you. But in the bigger pi picture, it's interesting how he says, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. You know, that says a mouthful when you think about it that God was willing to receive someone from the outside more, uh, we'll call it rapidly, uh, than someone who was right there on the inside professing to be something that he was not. In the big picture, 
what I want you to walk away with today, as I decided that this really kind of embodied the, 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 the three selves that I talked about, self-importance, which is probably at the top of the list, uh, self-preservation, but the most important one is self-surrender. Because at some point, the pride of Naaman was broken. He wasn't expecting the fanfare. He indeed went and did the simplistic thing of dipping seven times. And the self-surrender at that moment to God's word, to God's person and to God's word, brought him to the state of being cleansed and being whole versus the one who's right by the side of the man of God and very easily did what was right in his own eyes. And there's way too much of that within the body of Christ. Forget about outside. Think on these things, because if you look at these different people I've highlighted just in this one chapter alone, you can find with God, he'll put you perhaps in a situation like the little woman uh, to be used of God in the strangest of circumstances. Perhaps it's to be the messenger to a third or a second or a fourth party down the road to whom I don't know and neither do you. But also sometimes to be able to hear and to receive the word of God and to not argue and to not think that your pride and your knowledge and the I thought this is the way it ought to be, it's not according to the way Melissa Scott says. It's according to, to the way the word of the Lord says. If someone is willing to look, you'll find very clearly that when people came and sought the Lord to be healed, and he said, go, thy faith hath made thee whole. Not what you did and how you didn't and how you got there. The most important thing is to be able to hear and to let those words sink into your heart, take root, and when the time is, as for Naaman, this very simple act of dipping seven times, when the time is to say, thus saith the word of the Lord, and this thing that is in God's book is my it is my title deed to something I don't yet possess, but I'm holding on to say I claim it, it's mine. I'm not talking about the tangibles. I'm talking about the things that cannot be seen, that maybe cannot even be known at this moment, but are the things that we hold on to by faith and not some misguided, misapplied, misappropriated idea like somebody says, well, your faith, my faith is in Christ. And when we talk about that being rooted and grounded there, I can take every single promise that's in this book, whether my need today is for healing. And I said the leprosy that, Naam that Naaman suffered was to the Old Testament, an incurable disease. And to us looking at the New Testament, obviously Christ can talk and heal as those 10 went along. And he says, where are the nine? Just in speaking just in speaking the word, just in declaring a thing, and it is. No need to go through the rituals and everything else, but the faith that says, so be it unto you, is the same faith that should dwell richly in your heart. We're not saved by some way of purchase. We're not, the purchase is Christ, his blood, but we're not saved by the works or the, we'll call it the things, the effort that people think. And Naaman preeminently depicts this whole beautiful tapestry. You can have many people stuffed into one chapter with different reactions. The king, who should have been very quick to say, I know a man. The woman whose declaration sent another woman into that one's presence to say, go, I've heard of this one, right to Naaman going and doing what he did. And then, of course, as I said, there's always going to be people that are those barnacles within the church, within the religious spheres, within the spiritual life, who will do things their way for the benefit of themselves because they're so important in their eyes. But in God's eyes, he sees it all and he says, I'm not going to let you get away with it. Now, Gehazi is smitten with Naaman's leprosy. For us in the New Testament, we might say something like, we're not going to be like dogs returning to their vomit. We know from the pit which we were dug. We, we don't say, well, I'm just going to erase the pit and walk away. This is the beauty of God's book. He doesn't try to erase any of the very human and very natural things. He says, this is it. And I'm going to, excuse me, to be just this. He says, I'm going to let it all hang out for you to all see. This is exactly the way it is. And if you don't like that, don't come back with, I thought. Come back with, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm in need of your cleansing power, and I'm in need of your love 
and your everything that you have to offer, I'm in need of. And I don't come saying, I thank my God I'm not like so and so. I come saying, I know my condition, destitute, empty. Lord, here I am, I present myself. Here's the self-surrender, which I've week in, week out have referred to the scriptures. You should know it like this. You are to present yourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord. That doesn't mean that you come and you say, well, I'll do part of this thing. But Lord, I owe it all to you. You paid it all. And the very least I can do, the most reasonable thing is to present myself in surrender to you because you will order my steps. You'll be the light under my feet. You'll guide me. You will give me the wisdom and the knowledge in your spirit to also bring conviction to the things that displease you, to change me, to bring that new nature and that new person to a better understanding of who exactly you are in my life. And the word then comes even more to me as a true statement. Simply put, this is my word, abide in it, and I will abide in you. This is the sayings of this passage for me. I hope it speaks to you and shakes up some of those people out there that say, just that, is that it? That's it, folks. That's my message. Be seated for just a minute. I have one more thing to say. Now, there may, you may be seated. There may be a couple of people listening saying, oh, is there going to be an altar call now? <laughs> now? For the benefit of those people who didn't hear what I said because they, they, I thought, I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you. You know, the expression, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. I can stand here and I can tell you the simplicity. It's, Christianity is complicated, but the simplicity of faith, which Jesus pointed out, faith like a child, to listen and to not say, well, there must be something more. You know, maybe, Pastor, I'd like the message if you would have delivered it in five different languages today, because that would have been more complicated. Is that it? What I'm telling you is the simplicity of what I just did should be enough for every individual to say, that's all I need. And Lord, increase my faith as I go that I might come to better understand maybe it's those simple things that I've passed by so often, looking for the circus with all the elephants and all the fanfare and everything else. I missed that small, still, gentle voice. I missed it because I was looking for something bigger. I don't want you to miss it. You haven't if you heard the message today. You have been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California. Every Sunday morning, I teach the Word at 11 a.m. I invite you to join us if you'd like to receive a pass. Simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. Now, we're going to take you into another teaching segment, not from the sanctuary, which you've just been watching, but from the other place I teach from during the week. We call it the Festival of Faith. You know, I'm not sure where people get the idea that Christianity, somebody said this to me last week, Christianity is a religion of peace. Where'd you get that from? Now, unless you understand, you're reading the Bible where Jesus says he gives us his peace, that is what is of him, his nature, but Christ said, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That passage is nestled right, Matthew 10, nestled beginning with him calling the disciples, if you read through the whole chapter, that they should expect persecution. They should expect for the world to reject them, to not be received. The next he says about to not be afraid to not be walking in fear. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
goes into talking about whosoever confesses me before men. In other words, to not be ashamed of Christ, to not deny or be ashamed of Christ. And then think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I'm not sure where people get these, and they're like, I thought. They're the I thought ideas. Now we may say that people can be changed, like John was changed from son of thunder to disciple and apostle of love. And we can say somebody who was persecuting the church, Paul, became proclaimer and defender of the church. But I'm not sure that, I don't even know where the idea comes. And I guess it is maybe perpetuated greatly by the Catholic Church, by the clasping of hands and the kneeling and the rituals that uh, maybe ideologically promote some concept, but professing and proclaiming Christ is not something that will be accepted by all. This is why the conflict even in the church, in the churches and amongst the churches of those people who say, but I preach Christ. Look at Paul. He went into different places preaching Christ and it caused a ruckus and it caused riots. They didn't all come and respond to the altar call that Paul said, now come. And they all immediately, straightway, they put down their swords and, and, and they, they followed Paul. But even in the modern church, this is the age-old battle. People see the masses coming to these evangelist and these evangelistic services. And it must, it must be that whatever that is, then that must ideologically mean this is a religion of peace. But I'm sorry. Rightly understood, it's not. Christ said the world's going to hate you and reject you. If, if the world hated and rejected him, what makes you think it's going to love you? If you were of the world, the world would, would love its own, but you're not of the world. I've called you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Now, I don't think that we're, we're to say we're a, a system, a concept, a belief, values of um, this is black and white. Where there's love, there's hate. And where there is, if you want to go that, in that direction, where there is peace, there is also war. There's conflict. You can't say it's, this is a religion of peace. And if it was preeminently a religion of peace, and I really even hate to use the term religion, but if it was a religion of peace, he came to his own and his own received him not, and his own tried to kill him. That's peaceful. If it was so peaceful, then wouldn't they just have followed him? Christ brings conflict. Christ brings people. He says it right here. Man's foes will be the, those of his own household. Now, I mean, you can try and make that to mean whatever you want it to mean, but I can say, I could say first-hand knowledge. There have, there have been in, in I, I need to be very careful when I say this, in my former household, and I'm talking about flesh and blood, there were a lot of I thoughts. Now, when I came to know and to understand from the Bible, there was no more I thoughts. There was, this is what the Word of God says, and that's what I, that's what I know. That brought conflict. That brought ultimatums. You're either doing this or you're doing that, but you can't do both. But that's what I'm talking about even to people who you will have discussions with, which, as I said, you don't know where the seeds of those discussions go, but you might have discussions with people who are so enculturated by their I thoughts, what it ought to be, that their perceptual mindset of Christianity is, and then here comes the list, a Christian does, a Christian do, do, don't do, this is, you know, but I, I'm just not sure where the idea comes from. Furthermore, I'm not saying that we're a people of conflict, but if Christianity was a religion of peace, why are the people through the ages called Christians persecuted? 
tell me, if it's peaceful, then everybody wants to have peace and they join to peace. Because it's not. Now, we could talk about the individual and what God plants in the individual of God's nature that is so far removed from what we are that even if it's a microcosm that comes through, just something so small and so seemingly, forgive my term, insignificant, which will be what Galatians describes, fruit. We know what that fruit looks like, but is it all this? Is it all what people described? And again, I go back to how many of the disciples, if Christianity is a religion of peace, and how many of the disciples remained alive because they were preaching the gospel, because it was a religion of peace. It brought conflict. It brought persecution. It brought all except John, who died a natural death, death. So hopefully maybe I've cleared it up for one person listening. And for the rest of you, I've just confirmed what you already know. If you love the Lord, it comes at a cost. And that cost is usually either friends or family, people close by. Could be coworkers, could be anybody around you, just as they just develop a disdain, a dislike for you because of who you are, what you do, why you do it. And had you never opened your mouth, had you never shared, had you never disclosed, had you never said anything, you'd probably be best buds. And this is exactly what Christ was talking about in Matthew 10 when he said, if you deny, the opportunities will always be there for people to receive or reject. That's not your decision. That's theirs. Now, for those who have received, who have taken it to heart, and you know who you are, I'm taking your reservations, and I'm, I'm doing it in the most peaceful way I know. <laughs> <laughs> taking your reservations. At <laughs> what? All right. Reservations, commitments, I know there's people out there listening and saying, okay, she just put it all out there and it kind of sounds like she just let it out there like that, so sounds reasonable to me. And I'm not asking you to just take my word. I always tell you, check it out in the book. You'll find there are more things to back up what I've just said than all the traditions and all the stuff that's peddled out there in the name of Jesus. Now get on the telephone. Come to this house.